Let's face it, the last time the name Ultra was slapped onto a phone, it was more of a dumpster fire than anything. I mean, sure, HTC had good intents with the U lineup, but there wasn't really anything Ultra about it. Specs were late, the camera was meh, and the phone was just the behemoth for no valid reason. This is not the case for calling your device Pro or Plus, as that name gets tossed around a lot. Ultra is for products that are not just great, but that go great to an extreme. But what does a product need to be considered ultra? It can't just be a device without compromise because that's what flagships are supposed to be for, and it can't be another foldable because those are still an experiment. If you're gonna use the name ultra, your device has to be better than the best. And I think the time has probably come. This is the Galaxy S20 Ultra, what Samsung dubs as the phone that's gonna change photography, and which they believe is ultra enough for you to shell the price of a high-end computer to prove it. Lucky for you, that's what we're here for, and after testing it for the last couple of weeks, I've got a good idea of what it is and what it's not. I'm Jaime Rivera with Pocket Now, and this is our Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra review, sponsored by Subcase. My friends and I have had some crazy arguments over what the S20 Ultra replaces. Some feel that it's the direct successor to the S10 Plus, but some of us disagree. If you think about it, this is more a follow-up to the S10 5G, but with some crazy camera specifications that make this phone hard to be compared. This is like the times of the Nokia Lumia 1020, where that phone was so ahead of its time that even today, it's sometimes hard to find the match for it in certain ways. Let me begin this video by telling you what I like about this phone, and it starts with what you get. If there's one thing that's ultra about this phone, it's its internals. At the time of this video, there is not one more powerful smartphone. We have a Qualcomm Snapdragon 865, options for 12 or 16 gigs of RAM, 128 and up to 512 gigs of storage expandable, Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5, an insane 5,000 milliamp hour battery and support for 45 watt power delivery if you buy the extra adapter, 15 watt wireless charging, and nine watts wireless power share, which is even faster than what iPhones are able to support. Like seriously, this is the kitchen sink phone. There are no buts here. All that opens up the second reason why this phone is ultra and it's the 5G at the end of the name. Contrary to the way things were last year, this phone supports any flavor of 5G and it doesn't seem to require much intervention from you or the carrier. The version that we have is carrier unlocked. I used it the first couple of days on T-Mobile's low band. It worked just fine. And then I switched to Verizon's crazy fast millimeter wave connections all by swapping SIM cards. Now, I can't guarantee that this will be your experience, but so far this phone has proven to be very versatile, though more on my experience using 5G on the next section. The third reason why this phone is ultra is that we have, yet again, the best in class display. At 6.9 inches diagonal, Samsung's second generation Dynamic AMOLED is the largest I've used on a flagship, and the obsessive trimming of the bezels achieves a crazy 90% screen to body ratio. Switch on 120 hertz and the experience just spoils you. Just scrolling around anything is so buttery smooth that you're gonna have a hard time going back. At this setting, games automatically support 240 hertz touch sampling, and once you match that with the very loud dual firing speakers included, I'd say the experience and content consumption here is as good as it gets. Crazy specifications. The largest... And sure, we know all this is limited to Full HD+, plus, but if you do the pixel density math, I'd say faster refresh rates are more valuable. I'm even shocked that Samsung nearly did away with the curves on this display, but I find the change to be necessary if you plan to handle this phone with ease. And then the final cherry topper in this Ultra Pie is battery life. I never thought that Samsung could pull this off, but man, I've spent all this time using this phone at 120 hertz, 5G on different carriers with a permanent connection to my Galaxy Watch Active 2 and the usual interaction with Samsung's new Galaxy Buds Plus, and I could not kill this phone in a day. I'm not gonna call this phone legendary, but I end the day at 40% of a charge most of the time, and that's with a lot of stress. So I'm gonna call that one thing this phone gets right. But of course, there's no such thing as a perfect product. Even Tony Stark's Ultron project had its shortcomings. And well, you have an ultra smartphone right here. And yet implementation is what matters most regardless of the spec sheet. And that's one of those cases where I'm really mixed about this device. See, usually I begin my videos by telling you how much I like the hardware, but on this device, I'm gonna call that a chore. 
See, in typical Samsung fashion, the build quality is great, but this is a large and chunky phone. I know I've said that I prefer size if the functionality serves a purpose, and such a large spec sheet does make the heft logical, but man, even weight distribution on this phone is tough, and the only two color options seem really uninspired and dull if you ask me. And then there's the insane camera hump. Samsung hasn't provided any details as to the construction, so my advice to you is to protect this phone with a case. And I believe there is no better and more affordable solution than today's sponsor, Subcase. I'm the kind of guy that likes sleek and transparent cases, and the UB Style series doesn't just achieve that, but is also 15 foot drop certified by Metlabs, all with various color options to match your style. Those of you looking to go all out, the award-winning UB Pro has beat every other case in durability tests, adapts to harsh environments, includes a kickstand that works both vertically and horizontally, and even a belt holster. Best of all, both solutions are far less expensive than anything else in the market. I highly recommend you give Subcase a try. Follow the first link in the description below to learn more about why Subcase is so awesome. But back to the camera hump, at first I debated why it was so large. And then I realized that such a crazy and complete camera system has never been done before. The camera is just a beast. In numbers, it would even be a mistake to compare it to anything else out there. But let's face it, numbers are only as good as the results. Having such a large primary sensor allows for things that don't require software, like natural bokeh if you get close enough to your subject, and this phone excels at it, but I think that's the reason why it also struggles to focus every now and then. During the day, like most flagships, you'll have no complaints. Samsung is no longer oversaturating images. Instead, I love how most photos are really balanced in color and contrast, and if anything, I'd ask for the company to fix the viewfinder, because dynamic range is far better in the end results than what you see while taking the shot. I love that the ultra wide is also now far less distorted than before. And I actually like that the camera meters and adapts based on the focal length as having the same contrast isn't always ideal when zooming into a subject. And let me just be clear, photos up to 10X are completely usable and provide some crazy detail. I'm just not a fan of this phone making the jump to 5X directly. I think a far smarter solution would be to favor the 50 millimeter equivalent you find in 2X, which is what every other phone does. And then by contrast, those 100X space zoom photos are completely useless. So please ignore the bragging rights on the camera hump. You won't be able to use these even for stalking people. Now, when it comes to Samsung's night mode, I also like that it supports all focal lengths, even if these are limited when shooting in that mode. And I do feel the results give even the Pixel 4 a good run for its money, but stay tuned for that comparison, which is coming with more detail. I do love portrait photos and selfies from this phone, but I had to disable a ton of automatic beauty modes to achieve it, and these are settings you have to dig deep for. Once those are off, dynamic range is well preserved, subjects are not overly separated, and skin tones are also portrayed well. Now, video is one of those sections where I'm kind of mixed because even if colors and stabilization are really good, the lower the light becomes, the more you'll be exposed to warping and weird over-sharpening. And the fact that this phone can do 8K video is fantastic, but I do feel software needs to be a bit more tuned to improve autofocus in this particular mode. Now, to be fair, probably what I'm most shocked about this phone is how well it does selfie video, which could be a play of just how large the sensor is. There's just an insane amount of data being pushed, and I do love the fact that you can switch between cameras as you record. So this might just be a great pick for a phone you can vlog with. But if you ask me if this phone changes photography, well, the camera is great, but I don't think it's that much better than every other phone I've tested. How about if we step back into that conversation about 5G again? One of the major selling points for these phones is that they're all 5G. It's why they became more expensive. And yet I feel it's fair for everyone to understand what you're buying yourself into as 5G currently is more a promise than a reality in certain cases, like take the T-Mobile low band, for example. Yes, it is the most ubiquitous and you find that everywhere it penetrates walls better, but it's not that much faster than LTE. I'd call it more LTE plus plus of anything. If you were to do Verizon, well, I've gotten some crazy 1.5 gigabits down speeds in my tests, but so long as you find where to get those speeds, and which means you'll spend 99% of your time time on LTE. I'll be the first to lay your expectations more into the fact that you're buying into future-proof hardware here. 
And I wish I could say future-proof software, but this is not a phone you'll buy for timely software updates. The company has been doing a better job since the Galaxy Note 9, but it's not perfect. You will still be waiting months to get the latest and greatest features that Pixels get on day one. And yet, here's the thing. Samsung has been ahead of the curve in a ton of things that Pixels have been barely implementing lately. So I'm one of those people that actually doesn't care much about stock Android if you consider what you're getting here. I do care about secure folder to keep my work accounts separate. I do value the edge menus and the app pairs to have my favorite forms of interaction available to me at a glance. Guys, you can't even schedule night mode on a Pixel, which galaxies have been able to do since before Android 10. So my advice is that regardless of what you hear from diehard Android fans, you do not dismiss using this phone based on stock services that Samsung addressed years before Google did. To conclude, I have to admit that this is probably one of the most complex reviews I've ever done and for all the wrong reasons. I feel that if you're buying the most ultra beast of a phone, it should lead to the best smartphone experience ever. With the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra, the best numbers are here, but I can't say I feel that way about the implementation. And hey, if we're fair, the hardest part about giving you the Ultra experience is in achieving the numbers, so that part's been done. If you were to buy this phone right now, you literally are buying the most complete flagship there is, and what's missing can be fixed with a software update and some tuning. Bottom line, would I pay $1,399 for this device? Let me just be clear, nobody needs to pay so much money for any smartphone. I also feel this phone doesn't really change photography since the results aren't that much better than what I've seen from other devices I've compared it to. The main advantage here is that you're investing into buying the most future-proof phone there is. There is so much potential with all this hardware and Samsung's track record has improved in taking advantage of it through updates over time. If you wanna own the best muscle phone there is, this is it. But just keep that in mind as you test it yourself, as that 14-day return window might come in handy if you end up realizing that all that muscle is not that much better than other alternatives. Let us know your thoughts about the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra in the comments down below. And while you're at it, follow us on social media and subscribe to our channel for more videos like this one. Also follow me on my personal handles to see me play around with this phone in the real world. Please give this video a thumbs up if you like what you saw. I'm Jaime Rivera, thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next one.